In the world that we live in today, there are millions of people that are affected by huge problems. Problems that we, most of us in the stadium today, won't even imagine having to live through in our daily lives. We hear about some of these problems on the news. We hear about the countless number of people affected by malaria, by AIDS, by cholera. And we also feel a bit of disconnect with those problems because we don't have to live through our daily lives being affected by those problems. That is such the advantage that we have living in a great country like the United States. Today I want to talk to you about a problem, a huge problem that I witnessed while growing up as a child that I initially thought that there was nothing I could do about it because it was so big. But I then was inspired to take small steps towards stripping away at this problem. Uh, the, the, the story starts in a very small country that's halfway across the world from where we are today. Uh, and this small country is called Bangladesh. It's the country where I spent most of my childhood. It's nestled comfortably between India and Nepal. And then I mentioned the country is small. There is, but don't underestimate the size of the country. Over 160 million people live in this nation. That's the size of Iowa. That's about half the population of the United States. So that's a lot of people. But in my opinion, the people of Bangladesh are its greatest asset. And one of the second greatest assets, I think, of Bangladesh is its natural beauty. These two things together are what made my childhood so enjoyable. I remember waking up in the mornings when I was a kid and just always being excited to go outside and just hanging out with my friends. We'd just run outside in the fields, play soccer, and the only thing that would bring us back inside is our parents yelling at us, trying to get back home before dark. So I had a very fond memory of Bangladesh as a child. And another thing I remember was that the people of Bangladesh were such a prideful group of people. They loved their country. The country is very young. There's, it was only independent in 1971. You can see here, this is uh, 27,000 Bengalis assembling in the capital of Bangladesh, Dhaka, where they broke the world record for the largest human flag in 2014. This record was surely broken uh, afterwards by some other countries, but I guarantee you, no one banging off Bengalis. This record will be broken very quickly, once again. <laughs> and this was my memory of Bangladesh as a child. I, I loved the country, and as I grew older, my family moved to the United States, and would still go back to Bangladesh every year, because most of my relatives live in Bangladesh. But as I grew older, and living in the United States at the same time, I realized, I started realizing some of the more, like, realistic, I started realizing the realistic side of things in Bangladesh. The people, yes, they were happy, and yes, it was a beautiful country, but there were some real problems, like poverty, that afflicted the nation. And what came with this, these problems, one of the biggest problems I saw was that the people in Bangladesh, many of them, started to have these lesions on their skin. Many of my own friends, actually, as I grew older, I noticed that they were having these lesions on their skin. I was kind of wondering, what are these lesions? Turns out that these lesions on their skin is a very big signal of a huge underlying problem in Bangladesh called arsenic water poisoning. Arsenic is a naturally occurring chemical in the ground water supplies of Bangladesh, and it's carcinogenic. If you drink arsenic contaminated water over a long period of time, you will eventually get cancer in various parts of your body, like your kidneys, your livers. It could spread to essentially any part of your body. And it starts off with these spots in your hands. And I realized just how big this problem was, probing into it, because over 70 million people in Bangladesh were affected by arsenic water poisoning. That's about half the population in Bangladesh. And, and not surprisingly so, the World Health Organization called this the largest mass poisoning in the history of the world. Because that's 70 million people. That's about eight times the population of New York City that's at risk of cancer because of drinking this silent poison. By the way, arsenic does not look like anything. It doesn't taste like anything. The water looks fine. So, I was overwhelmed by taking in this information. Because when I was a child, Bangladesh, the image of Bangladesh in my head was that it was a, you know, like it was a beautiful country and you know, people are happy. And, and, and that was largely true. But as I grew older, I, I, I realized you know, that the people were suffering. They were suffering from this problem. And, I, and growing up with these people, I felt that I had a responsibility to try to do something about it. But what could I do? This problem was so big, 70 million people. And, I mean, initially I was like, there's nothing I can do about this. But, 
I felt so responsible. Like I just felt this sort of this feeling inside me that I had to do something that I started thinking about it one step at a time. Why is this problem happening? Are there any solutions to this problem right now? And if there are, why aren't those solutions working? It turns out that there was a solution in Bangladesh. There is the Sama water filter, which was a filter made of the that removed our signal water. The Sama water filter actually worked very well, but the biggest problem is that it cost over 60 US dollars, whereas the average person in Bangladesh made two to three dollars a, a day. And I, really, I was wondering, why is this so expensive? I mean, it's just two buckets. It doesn't even look that good. Where's the cost coming from? Turns out that the filter made use of a very special part called the iron composite matrix that was patented. And it costed money uh, to be able to use that part in every filter. It drove the prices of every unit off. So it was then that I was inspired. Why not build up my own design of a filter that would make use of open source materials? Materials that anyone could use, that are affordable, that are locally available, that could be easy to make, and that also could look better. <laughs> I researched, I, I did a lot of research, and long story short, I came across a resource called the Yellow Sands. These sands in Bangladesh were rich in iron, and they were capable of removing arsenic from the water, and they're widely available. Nobody can handle these things. So I was like, how can I use these sands? I came up with my own design of a unibody filter design, and I built up a prototype within the kitchen of my home in Dallas. And it doesn't look pretty, but this is kind of what I took to various science fairs that were going on in the area. And surprisingly enough, I was surprised that people even took me seriously, but the EPA, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, gave me their wholehearted support on taking this filter to the next level. It was then I realized that this is no longer just a dream. I actually had the power in my hands to probably make this happen. So I fundraised a lot of money within my community that summer, and I started a nonprofit organization called Icomi. The mission of Icomi was to provide affordable drinking water to as many people as possible. We partnered up with a larger nonprofit organization called the Sabrina Memorial Foundation, which was, at the time, doing a lot of work in Bangladesh with healthcare and education. Together, we partnered up to help solve this big problem with water contamination. This was the result of that partnership. That we built a lot of these filters here. And this was kind of the embodiment of, a unique, uh, of the ideal filter. It would be a unibody design with the colors of the Bengali flag that the people take so dearly to their hearts. So it's a design that both works, and it's also something that people might want to own. We went to the hardest hit areas in Bangladesh. This is Rajapur, Bangladesh, where 90% of people are affected by our stuff, our poisoning. And over here, we were met with overwhelming demand, and people, everyone seemed to want one. I mean, it looked pretty good, in their opinion, and it did the job. And that was what I was going for. And I was surprised by such positive reception. Even the media picked up our story. And um, it quickly spread across the nation what we were trying to do. And over then, it was then that I realized that, like, you know, I just think that this problem is so hard to overcome. And yes, it definitely is. The first step was definitely the hardest. But beyond that, the support from everybody, both the people that are receiving the filters, from the government, the media, it seemed like the only place we could go was up. But I realized that, you know, the problem is still not being even close to being over. Over one in 10 people still lack the effects of drinking water worldwide, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I should like, not do anything about it. See, my organization so far, we have changed the lives of about 5,000 people. About 5,000 people now have access to clean drinking water that did not have it before. And in the grand scheme of things, there's 70 million people that still lack it. And I, it seems like a drop in the ocean, what I've done. And I realized that. But I realized that if I haven't done that, then there would be 5,000 less people that wouldn't have had say, nice to drink water. If we all think about problems this way, I think we can all, together, take small steps at a time to help solve the biggest problems that affect us in our generation. So today, I, I ask all of you today, take a look inside your own communities. What problems do you see that affect your community? And no matter how big those problems are, what can you do about them? No matter how small they, how, no matter what small step you can take, that first step is usually the hardest step, and most people are not willing to take that first step. But once you take that first step, I guarantee you that the support you'll get from your friends, your family, from other people around you, we can all work together to solve the greatest problems of our generation. Thank you very much. <laughs>